Another example, then I want to talk about the pros and cons of these government interventions. Let's do another example. Gas price ceilings, OK? Gas price ceilings, OK? So let's consider a cap on how much can be charged for gas. Seems pretty sensible policy. Gas is crazy expensive. We all like to drive. So let's consider, um, uh, let's consider a cap on the price of gas. Imagine, for example, we're initially in equilibrium in figure 2.6 with a demand of Q2 and a price of P1. We're all happy, OK? Now let's imagine there's an oil crisis, gas, because let's say oil companies decide it's a good idea to drill eight miles underground and everything explodes and we're suddenly running out of oil, OK? So suddenly, all of a sudden, there's a constraint in the supply. Suddenly, there's a, um, I, I'm sorry, we're initially, I'm sorry, my bad. We're initially in equilibrium at E1, my bad. We're initially at, at equilibrium at E1 with a price of P, OK, with a price of P1. There's a bit of mislabeling here. Um, on the vertical axis, that upper price should be P2. So on the vertical axis, you see there's P1 equals P. Then above it, it says P1 again. That should say P2. So we're initially in equilibrium at point E1 with a price of P1 and a quantity of Q1. Now, oil tanks blow up all over the world. We suddenly, suddenly that means there's a restriction in the supply of gas. Suddenly there's not as much gas as can be produced. So that's an upward shift in the supply curve, just like we talked about before. And absent any government intervention, the supply curve would shift up to S2. Consumers would want less gas. And you'd reach a new equilibrium at E2. And once again, I'm talking about equilibrium as being where people are happy. Now you can say, well, gee, people aren't happy paying a higher price for gas. Well, that's why my, I'm a bit glib using the term happy. It's a point where the suppliers and demanders are jointly willing to make the deal. Okay? And they're willing to make the deal at E2. They're willing to say, look, given how many oil things that rigs have blown up, we are happy to equilibrate the market now at a higher price and a lower quantity. But then, you know, it's. September 2010, there's an election two months away. President Obama isn't very happy about this. OK, he says, you know, forget it. We're going to cap the price at P. We were paying P before. We can pay P again. Those stupid oil companies can suck it up. They're the ones who drilled eight miles underground. They're the ones who blew everything up. They can suck it up. We're keeping the price at P. We'll help the consumer. OK, we'll keep the price. Well, what happens? What happens is that. Um, uh, consumers are now great. We continue to want Q1. That's where before we were happy. Okay. But producers say, well, you know what, President, we can't supply that much at that price. Because it costs us so much to drill oil now okay, that if you're going to force us to keep the price at P1, we are only going to supply Q sub D. Because we, can't, we just can't supply at that low price. We're going to supply Q sub D. So what happens, you end up with excess demand. Consumers want Q sub D gallons. Producers want, are going to willing to produce only Q sub S. And you end up with uh, disequilibrium. And in this case, once again, the amount sold is what the producer are willing to sell. It doesn't matter how much consumers want if producers aren't willing to sell it. You end up with disequilibrium, and you end up with much, much less gas being sold. Okay? So yeah, the price stays low. But the amount of gas being sold is much lower than if the president allowed the price to rise. Okay, so that's another example of uh, of a government intervention causing disequilibrium. Okay, so now, any questions about that? Yeah. Great. Uh, great. Hold that thought for 1441, but that's exactly what the government could do. The government has lots of tools. So it can come in and say, well, on the one hand, we set a price cap, but then we'll come in on the other hand and give a subsidy to oil producers to make sure they do that. That has two problems. One is not so good with the voters. Like, gee, we're going to give subsidies to oil companies. Isn't that a great idea? Okay. Two is you've got to raise the money somehow, which means you've got to raise taxes. Also not so good with the voters. So, it's, in general, not a good idea because you've screwed up on the one hand to screw up again. Because it's, you know, two wrongs don't make a right, something to learn from an early age. If the government's messed up the market on the one hand, it's not generally a good idea to try to mess, mess with it again to fix that. But that's exactly the kind of stuff we'll discuss in 1441. Yeah. 
great, great segue to what I want to talk about next, which is what are the costs and benefits of these kinds of market interventions, of a minimum wage or a gas price ceiling? Why do we do this? I mean, the government, these aren't stupid people by and large. Okay? Why do governments do things like this? What are the costs and benefits? Okay? Now, later this semester, we'll talk about welfare economics. By welfare, welfare has two meanings. We still think of welfare as being money you distribute to poor people. That's one meaning. But we say welfare and economics, we actually mean well-being, the well-being of society. And we'll talk about the well-being of society later on um, in, the, uh, in, in the semester. But let's talk for a minute about this general topic and how do we think about the kind of welfare economics of these restrictions. Well, there's two costs and one benefit to these restrictions. Okay? The first cost is the efficiency loss. Okay, so the costs of things like the minimum wage and uh, the minimum wage and gas price ceilings, the first cost is the efficiency loss. And we are going to be much more precise. This lecture is sort of a chance to be loosey-goosey about things that I'll then make much more precise throughout the semester. We were precise about what we mean by this throughout the semester. But the key point is, in economics, whenever there is a trade that can be made that makes both parties better off, and it is not made, that is an inefficiency. So in economics, we define efficient as when all trades that can make both parties better off are made. And wherever anything comes up that interferes so a trade that can make both parties better off is not made, that is inefficient. There's an efficiency loss. And think about it. It makes sense. If, you, if both parties can be made better off by a trade and you don't let it happen, then society is worse off. Okay? That's the idea of an efficiency loss in economics. Economics is all about trading to make things work more efficiently. When you don't let that happen, you've hurt society. You have a welfare loss. Okay? Because you know, something could have made both people better off. That would have been a good thing to do. You haven't allowed that to happen. Okay? And if we think about it, in both these examples, figure 2.5 and 2.6, there are trades that would have made both parties better off that we're not allowing to happen. So in the labor market case, think about a wage that's, below, that's above W star and below W bar, lower bar. So a wage in that interval. At that wage, Workers would be happy and, and take unemployed workers. Okay? Unemployed workers would be happy to work at a wage somewhat below W bar. Firms would be happy to hire them at a wage somewhat below W lower bar. But it isn't happening because the government has interfered. That's an efficiency loss. Likewise, look at figure 2.6. Okay? Consumers would be happy to pay a somewhat higher price and get some more gas. Producers would be happy to produce more at that higher price, but it's not happening. That's an efficiency loss. Okay? So an efficiency loss is whenever there are trades that can make both sides better off that don't happen. Okay? And once again, this is loosey-goosey here. We'll make this all more precise as the semester goes on. But it's important to get the big picture concept of what I mean by efficiency in economics, which is trades being made that make both parties better off. The second cost here is what we call allocation inefficiency. Remember in the first lecture, I talked about how prices play three roles in the market. They determine what is to be produced, they determine how it is to be produced, and they determine who gets it. That's called allocation. Price plays a critical role in, in making sure that the people who want the good the most get it. Because remember, that demand curve is a willingness to pay curve, or a willingness to buy curve. Okay? What that lets us know is the further up the demand curve, the more people want the good. Okay? And we should make sure that those people are allocated, are allocated that good. Okay? So in a world of equilibrium, we make sure the allocation happens. The pr anybody who wants the good at a price that consumers are willing to sell it gets it. Someone who wants it, who doesn't want it at that price, doesn't get it. Equilibrium takes care of that allocation problem. But in disequilibrium, it doesn't. So let's consider the gasoline example. Now we have a case where 
there are many, many people, in fact, all the, all the folks who lie between QS and QD on that X axis, all those folks want gas at that low price, okay, but can't get it. Only, only the, oh, there's only QS being supplied. So what happens? Well, what happened to folks, you guys weren't alive for this, uh, but in the 1970s, does anyone know what happened when we did price ceilings of this type? Does anyone know what happened? Yeah. Gas shortage, and, and how did people respond? How was gas allocated in that gas shortage? Lines. People waited on huge lines. Basically, we couldn't use the price mechanism, so what did we do? We used the wait mechanism, okay, just like they used to do in Russia all the time, okay, and still do. Okay? If price can't, the point is it's got the gas that's limited, that QS, has got to get allocated somehow. In the market, it gets allocated by the price rising until Peep, until the price is high enough that the set of people who want it at that price get it. With this gas price ceiling, that can't happen. So what happens? Lines for gas. Huge hours long wait. I mean, this is sort of inconceivable now. I mean, sometimes you have to wait at a gas pump. But pretty much you drive up, you get your gas, you leave. In the 1970s, literally you'd wait hours, more than multiple hours online to get gas. That was how the gas was allocated in the face of these gas price ceilings. Okay? Now this is in, yeah. Uh, okay, let me come back to that. Um, yeah, hold, hold that thought for a couple minutes. I want to come back to that. But I want to focus on these gas price lines and why they're bad. Okay? Well, these gas price lines are themselves a source of inefficiency, and why? Why is it inefficient after you're waiting in line for gas? Yeah? They could be working, they could be out making trades that make everybody better off. They, instead of being in line waiting for gas, they could have been at work working for a wage that they were happy to earn and their employer was happy to pay. So a trade is not being made, unless they're equally happy sitting in line waiting for gas, okay, which is doubtful. Okay? A trade is not being made, which makes both parties better off. What else? Did the government know about this? Yeah. Yeah, it was, believe me, they did. But they said, well, gee, we can't let people pay those high prices. Governments face really hard decisions like this all the time. There's another problem, of course, which is what happens when people waiting in line for gas? They're idling and using up gas. Okay, so in fact, there was a direct mechanical inefficiency as well, which is all the gas that was wasted while people idling in line waiting to get their gas. Okay, so that's the sort of kind of inefficiency you used to thinking about as engineers. Okay, uh, there's a mechanical inefficiency, but the main thing we care about is the allocative inefficiency, which is people would be better, trades are not being made because people sitting in their cars waiting for gas. And that's inefficiency. And that inefficiency arises because we have to allocate the gas somehow. Okay? You can't get around that problem. Remember, we are the dismal science. Okay? We point out problems that cannot be surmounted. You can't get around that problem. That gas has to get allocated somehow. And if you don't let the price mechanism allocate it, some other more inefficient mechanism will arise to do so. Okay? Now, the trade-off, of course, is then you keep the price low, and the government's got to decide, once again, it's the political economy of how the governments make these decisions, and that's not really the point of this course. But that's the kind of decision they have to make. Now let's come, and this will touch on your question. Oh, did you have a question about this? Well, I think it's a question. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically, in some sense, you know, the bottom line is equilibrium is where people are going to work for what their company is willing to pay. Now, you could say if people want work more than the company wants to offer it, that's sort of a difficult subjective judgment. But at the end of the day, if people are willing to work for a dollar and the company is willing to hire them for a dollar, then that's a trade which should be made. Except that's a great example to point out, same person just said that, well, then tell me what's the benefit of a minimum wage? It's equity. That thing economists like to not think about because it's tricky. Okay? It's fairness. It's equity. It's unfair that you'd work for a dollar a day. Okay? And people might be exploited and work for unfairly low wages. Okay? Likewise, it's unfair that we pay a huge amount for gas. 
Okay? And so people should, we should keep the wage high and the prices low to make it fair. And that's the, the pro of the minimum wage. Yeah? Wonderful, wonderful point. Wonderful point. That's because in economics, okay, there's the direct effect and the indirect effect. And the direct effect is what voters understand, and the indirect effect is what we understand. Okay. In, ga in the case of gas, it was easy to see the question, why, why did the government realize this? Everyone saw the direct effect, which was low prices, and the indirect effect, which was long lines. With the minimum wage, it's harder, because there's lots of reasons for unemployment, not just the minimum wage. So the indirect effect is a lot harder to see. So your politician's saying, look, I raised the minimum wage, I'll make sure you paid more. Everybody goes, yay. And then the economist says, well, you have to understand that according to this diagram, that would lead to unemployment. And people are like, whatever, shut up. OK? So basically, the point is that basically, yes, you're right. But for perceived equity, this is the case. And in fact, so, but, but you're right, there's a trade-off. Just like they recognize the trade-off between the price and the lines, there's a trade-off between the higher wage and the unemployment. And that comes to what we'll talk about empirical economics which is measuring that trade-off. Well, how big is that trade-off? How much unemployment does a higher minimum wage cost? In fact, we'll learn in about nine lectures that it actually doesn't cause that much unemployment. OK? It actually doesn't. And so maybe the trade-off isn't that bad. But in principle, there's a trade-off. OK? Now, that comes to your point about shutting people's water off and things like that, and the government making sure that uh, the suppliers make sure people's water doesn't get shut off. Once again, one way to do that is just say to the, produce, to the water company, you can't shut people's water off even if they don't pay their bills. Well, that's going to mean the water company is going to lose money in those people. That will raise the cost of supplying water. Okay? And that will lead to the same kind of problems we've talked about. But if the government then says, OK, a price cap, and then we're going to pay you for the people who don't pay, that's kind of like the idea before. You can have sort of these countervailing interventions. But then it starts to get messy. You've got to raise the money to pay them, et cetera. So that's why equity is so hard. Because once you, if it's efficiency, it's easy. Okay? You just don't do anything. Okay? With equity, it gets a lot harder because the government has to intervene to address equity. And then that causes other problems. Cause these equity efficiency trade-offs. And that's a lot of what will, that, that's a lot of the problems that raises. Okay? All right. So now, let's talk about one last example to stop. Which is the, it's, I don't have a diagram for this one, but let's talk about the great example. It's a real world example that happens a lot, which is water shortages. How do you live from California? You guys know water shortages. You guys know about how this works. You guys know the drill, which is that um, there'll be a drought, and the government will say you can only use X gallons per day. You can't water your lawn, or, um, you know, you, uh, uh, actually, let me ask the Californians. So they actually, does the government like monitor your meter or just tell you? Like, is it enforced? Tell just tells you. OK, so the government says you can't do this, you can't do that. Maybe they enforce it, maybe they don't, whatever. But the government comes in and says, look, there's not enough water. OK, and so as a result, we are going to limit your uses of water. Yeah? That's OK, hold on, time out. That's because the government got smart. So let's go back 10 years ago. OK, so what they'll do is they'll come in and they'll say, uh, you can't use, um, you can't use uh, as much water. Now, this has two problems just like we talked about. First of all, there are households which would happily pay more to make sure they got to use the same amount of water, and those trades are not being made. Okay, The first inefficiency. Moreover, it's got the problem that you're not allocating the water appropriately. Okay, Some guys are just dirty and don't like to shower. Okay, Some guys are clean and care a lot about showering and want to allocate the water to the clean guys. Okay? But the government typically doesn't do that. It just says, don't use more than x gallons. Okay? So there's an allocation inefficiency as well, where the people that value the water the most aren't getting it the most. Okay? Now, tell me about tiered pricing. So it's like if you use 0 to 80 gallons per year or per month or whatever, you, get, you pay a certain price. And then if you use 81 to 120, you pay an extra on those gallons. And then you pay even more gallons. Exactly. So what the government can do, the right answer is the government can price, can use the price mechanism to deal with the shortage. And the way it can do that is by saying, we're going to let the price increase. Okay? We're going to let the price increase, and we are going to um, allow 
the price to be a function. You see here's pricing, but you make that a function of the underlying conditions in water supply. So basically you have a tiered pricing and as if there's a drought, the prices all go up. So the government sets the price for water and it says, look, the price this year will be higher if there's a drought. And what that'll do is that'll make sure whoever wants the water gets the water and make sure we allocate the people who need it the most. Okay? Does anyone, can anyone think of another way you could do this? Kind of never really work in reality, but it's kind of a fun, fun way to think about it. It's another way to do it. Well, imagine that what I did is I said every Californian uh, gets a certain amount of water permits. Every Californian gets, I don't know how many gallons of water people use, I don't know. You get 500 gallon a year, I don't know, that's too much, 1,000 gallon a year water permit. Okay? How many gallons of water people use in a year? I got no idea. What is it? Thousand? Let's say a thousand. Okay. Thousand gallon a year water permit. Okay? We're going to give you a thousand pieces of paper. Each one permits you to use a gallon of water. Okay? Now, what we're going to let you do is trade those pieces of paper with your neighbors. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to say in normal times, you can have a thousand. You, basically, there's enough water, everyone gets a thousand. Okay? Then we're going to say when times are tight, that basically you can only have, you can only use 900 gallons. Okay? So what that's going to mean is that you're going to have to uh, have permits that allow you to use those gallons. And you're going to have to buy those permits off your neighbors. So basically, we can allow neighbors to trade. And the neighbor that says, I don't care about water so much. So what's going to happen now is the government's going to say, this year, we only issue 900 gallon permits to each of you instead of 1,000. Now you say, you're a clean person. You say, wait a second. I want to use 1,000 gallons. So you go to your neighbor and say, look, you're dirty. OK? You don't need more than 800 gallons. Sell me your extra 100. The government gave you 900. I want my 1,000. The government gave me 900. Sell me your extra 100. The neighbor says, sure. And they set a price, and they sell to you. And it works out to be exactly the same outcome as if the government had used pr the proper pricing. Because that secondary market somebody asked about black markets. This is a secondary market can evade the government regulation. So once again, the market equilibrium is very robust. And if you can figure out a way to evade the government regulation, you will. If there's some way with permits, if there's some way to trade, now you can't reality, you can't really trade water. But if you could, then you could use a market mechanism to overcome this problem. Yeah? Is that what I mean, one of the suggestions was um, for you know, the global warming type thing, the car giving credit? Exactly. So global warming, um, actually, I flew with Al Gore over to Kyoto in 1997 and negotiated the global warming treaty, so it's something near and dear to my heart. And uh, with global warming, that's exactly the solution that's part of the Kyoto Protocol, the framework that was set up at that meeting, which is that basically there'll be a certain limit on how much carbon dioxide can be emitted into the air. And that, but, but there'll be permits and countries can actually trade across each other. So, and the idea is, look, in the US, it's incredibly expensive to reduce the emissions we have. Because what you have to do is you have to take a coal-fired plant and retrofit it to use natural gas instead. Well, in China, they haven't built the plant yet. They're building the plant. And it's not that much more expensive to build to be natural gas instead of coal. So in China, it's pretty cheap to reduce emissions. Because just say, OK, I was going to build a coal, I build a natural gas instead. It's pretty much the same cost. I've just reduced emissions. So the idea is that we would trade with China, that we would pollute more, and China would pollute less. I'm sorry, we would pollute more, China would pollute less. But the global total would be the same. Now, as you hear that, you might think that's kind of controversial. But in fact, it makes total sense. Just like it might be controversial that dirty neighbors are selling water to clean neighbors. You can imagine the newspaper articles, the outrage. People forced to be dirty to make, a, to make ends meet. OK? <laughs> but that's not right. What's right is, it's, what's right is you want to allocate to people who want, who need, who, for whom it's most efficient. It is more efficient for China to reduce emissions, because it's cheaper than for the US to reduce emissions. So the efficient system, we just say, here's the total amount of emissions we're going to reduce. And we're going, to let China do, we're going to let China do extra reduction or pollute less. And the US gets to continue our slovenly ways. And that's the efficient outcome. Okay. Um, one last thing on this note. Many of you may know who Larry Summers is. 
Larry Summers was uh, actually my thesis advisor, who then went on to be Secretary of the Treasury, had a somewhat failed stint as president of Harvard, and is now Obama's top economic advisor. Well, Larry Summers has gotten himself in trouble two times. You all know about the time he said women are stupid. Okay, but the other time he got himself in trouble was in 1990, he, his, he actually signed his name to a memo. He didn't actually write a signed name to a memo saying that the efficient thing to do is we should ship all our garbage to poor countries. And he said that's efficient because countries have lot, poor countries have lots of, what do they have? They have lots of space and not much money. What do we have? Lots of money and not much space. So the efficient thing to do is we should take our garbage and put it on barges and send it to Africa. Okay? He was right. That is the efficient thing to do. Africans would be better off because they have lots of space they're not using and they'd be richer. U.S. would be better off because we would be able to get rid of our garbage and we're happy to pay to do it. That's the trade to make it better off. And yet it got him fired, okay, the, writing that memo. That's why economics is a dismal science, because we point out things like this.